you're a marine. You're just settling down to sleep in the barracks with your brothers in arms in Echo Base on Zeta Halo. The camp is a large, heavily guarded forward operations base supplied by the biggest UNSC ship still in operation, the flagship of the fleet, the UNSC Infinity. The camp is guarded by a constant presence of ODSTs commanded by a fire team of Spartan Fours, and every gun the UNSC has in this base is aimed outward to any threats that may stray too close to the camp. You are as safe as it is reasonable to be. You begin to drift off to sleep, putting the day's activities behind you as you look forward to seven hours of R&R. &R. Right as you're about to submit to sleep, a sound wakes you back up. You listen carefully to the ambience around you. You hear the slow, sleepful breathing of the other marines nearby. Occasionally the steady breeze outside picks up enough to be heard moving the trees. And in the distance, the periodic howl of the foreigner beacons echo out across the landscape. Aside from the sounds of the wildlife on the ring, you don't hear anything that outwardly draws your attention. You settle back down, trying to relax your senses back to a calm. The sound of a gut-wrenching scream and gunfire wrenches you back to your senses. You dive out of your bunk and scramble to get your gear on. The sounds of voices shouting can barely be heard over the gunfire. You've drilled countless times the process of getting geared up and ready, yet right now your heart is thumping in your chest and you find yourself fumbling to get sorted. As the rest of the marines finish gearing up, they begin filtering out of the barracks to join the fight. As you put on your left boot, the gunfire draws closer and louder, but there are less guns firing. Over the sounds of people shouting orders and calling out targets, the blood-curdling screams of fallen soldiers can be heard. The last of the marines have finished gearing up and left the barracks. You are now the only one left, but you're going to be right behind them. You finish up putting on your right boot, stand and slap your helmet on, and get ready to leave the barracks to go and arm yourself. That is until you notice the sound of the battle has stopped. You now stand alone in the centre of the barracks as you try to make sense of the sudden, eerie silence. Your mind now racing in the stillness you find yourself in. The sound of your heart beating is practically all you can hear. There is no gunfire, no voices shouting orders, no screams, no wildlife, no breeze, even the sound of the beacons seem to have fallen more distant. You stand in silence. A shadow darts past the entrance of the barracks. You tense in response. You reach for a weapon you haven't yet collected and scan the room for anything you can use to defend yourself. Nothing. You take a few slow steps backwards from the entrance and wait. Nothing. Despite your fear, despite the silence, curiosity now begins to niggle at the back of your mind and you find yourself taking steps towards the entrance. You stop just a metre shy of the entrance and will yourself to crane your neck out of the doorway to get a clear view of the camp beyond. Slowly, the camp comes into view. It's dark, but the light reflecting off of a part of the halo ring further up spin grants enough light to see clearly the camp, casting long, harsh shadows. You scan the area and notice a familiar shape. There is a single person stood about ten metres from your position at the corner of a polycrete building, partially obscured by shadow. They're not doing anything. They're just stood there. You pluck up the courage to leave the barracks and quietly cross the space between you and the only other friendly in the area. You advance steadily across the ground, scanning for any targets as you close on your only ally. You stop just short of touching distance 
when you notice a set of eyes looking back at you. They look surprised, shocked maybe, but something doesn't sit right. They're not looking at you, they're looking past you. You glance over your shoulder to follow their gaze and see nothing but across the camp. No movement, no apparent threat. You turn back, confused, and look into the eyes again. That's when you notice it. They're the wrong way up. The eyebrows are on the bottom and the nose is facing skyward. The eyes focus slowly drifts from something akin to a thousand yard stare and focus on you. The expression the eyes give off now shift to something like fear, horror, even sadness. Then the person makes a noise, but it isn't a noise, it's more of a gurgled choke. Then it hits you. You're stood behind this person, not in front of them, and yet their eyes are looking straight at you. Your brain suddenly makes sense of what you're looking at. The person's neck has been bent backward at an impossible angle, the head now hanging limp down its back. You nearly stumble backwards in surprise and the commotion draws its attention. The thing turns around and from the chest of this humanoid form there are now a dozen tentacle-like sensing appendages whipping the air, like as many forked tongues of a snake tasting the air for your presence. The body is swollen and tumorous, and three meter-long tentacles now hang from its left arm. You're frozen in fear when the creature bellows a twisting ear-splitting cry and whip cracks its tentacles across your chest. The impact sends you flying backwards with the force of being hit by a warthog. You land flat on your back, ten feet away. The air is knocked out of you and you reach up to your chest to try to will your lungs to expand and draw in air. Your hand meets something warm and sticky. Through your dazed and blurred vision, you make out your hand slick with blood. Your blood. Your breathing is fast and shallow, your heart is throbbing in your ears and you struggle to sit up. The creature that just struck you is gone. You look down to your chest and find your armour cracked wide open and you have a deep cut to your chest. Under it you can see the white of your sternum. You hear a peculiar sound and look up to see a large bulbous squid-like creature dancing towards you on a flurry of tentacles. You try to push yourself backwards away from it when your hand brushes something cold and metallic in the mud. Your hands recognise the shape, you wrap your fingers around it and lift the pistol into firing position and squeeze a single round into this tentacled squid. It pops and splatters you and the surrounding area in green congealed blood. You remain still for a few moments as the camp once again descends into silence. Then something feels like it moves in the wound of your chest. You look down to find the green congealed blood of the squid is now festering in the wound in your chest and it feels like worms or maggots are wriggling around inside the wound. The sensation causes you to drop the pistol back into the mud and try to claw at the wound, but the feeling of movement just burrows deeper into your chest. The sound of the closest beacon firing its blue plasma ball into the air draws your attention, and as it bathes the area in harsh blue-white light, you suddenly notice the horde of twisted flesh boiling across the camp towards you, a mix of hundreds of those squid-like creatures with the mutated remains of every single occupant of the camp following behind. Your shot had drawn their attention, and in the next two seconds they close the distance between them and you. You fumble for the pistol, grab it, and take aim right as another squid dives onto your chest, the heavy, wet weight of it forcing you back to the ground. You try to bring the pistol up to shoot when something forces your hand away. You squeeze the trigger anyway, firing off rounds when something stops you from doing that too. Nothing is holding your arm, it's you. Something inside of you is stopping you. You hear a buzzing in your ears, no, inside your head. You feel the most intense pain you have ever felt and your body is suddenly moved against your will, rolling you onto your front and into a crouch as you feel your left wrist and forearm snap, the bone bursting through the skin and three long tentacles suddenly exploding from the wound. 
You feel tentacles sliding around beneath your skin and your head being forced backwards with immense force. You look towards the sky, the arc of the halo above you, as your neck meets its structural limit, and you hear crunching and popping noises. The buzzing in your head begin to morph into a voice, a deep, twisted voice. And as your neck breaks and your view suddenly changes to an upside down view of the camp, your vision begins to narrow. And as the darkness swallows you, the voice calls out and utters a single word. Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00. It's Halloween, which means it's the right time of year to look at the horrors of the Halo universe. And nothing screams horror like the Flood. How about that introduction though? Today, we're going to look at the entire process of Flood infection from start to finish. We're going to assume that rather than killing you, the process keeps you fully aware, but unable to resist or react in any way. Just experience it in all its grotesqueries. We'll look at the process of infection by the three major methods. Inhalation of flood spores, possession by an infection form, and infiltration by a proto-grave mind. And past this, what eventually happens to you, or rather, your body, in the long term. Let's do this. Spores are the quantum of flood infection. They are tiny, airborne particulates of flood biomatter. They are released anywhere a flood infection has taken hold. And while the infection form is the flood's most often utilized form of infection, a being can be infected by spores alone, if at a much slower rate. Infection will happen through an inadvertent inhalation of a flood spore. At this point, the spore will interface with the host's biology and then begin the process of mutating the host's cellular genetics and converting the normally healthy cells into flood biomass. To a degree, this method of infection, at least the host, bears a closer resemblance to the latter stages of terminal cancer, although from a biological perspective it is more akin to the cordyceps fungus. To the host, there would be no immediately apparent response to the infection in short order, however, the host would experience a fever as the body reacts to the presence of an unknown pathogen and attempts to fight it. The spore, however, will already be converting normal cellular structures into flood biomass, which itself produces spores that continue to infect more of the body in an accelerating feedback loop. It is likely that the process of inhalation of the spore will result in an initial infection taking hold within the respiratory system, likely the lungs. As a flood tumour begins to form in the lungs, the person's breathing would become impaired. As the new flood biomatter no longer serves the function of processing oxygen and carbon dioxide, this would result in laboured breathing and a drop in blood oxygenation levels. Sensations of movement under the skin would be of significant distress to the host as they begin to experience the more aggressive stages of infection. The spores would rapidly find their way into the circulatory system as well as the endocrine system. At this stage, the spores will rapidly travel across the body and begin to metastasize. New tumors would appear across the entire body and the host's organs would begin failing. At this stage, blood oxygenation levels would likely have reduced significantly enough to immobilize the host, causing their brain to slip in and out of consciousness. By this stage, the flood infection would already be taking hold in the host's central nervous system where the spores would actually differentiate the neural tissue from the biomass of the rest of the body. This is when the host's mind would begin to be detached from the body and depending on where the infection is more prevalent in the central nervous system, 
would result in either an out-of-body experience ending in death, or the very rapid reduction of cognitive function also resulting in death. But we're on the assumption that the process doesn't kill the host and instead simply leaves them to endure what is happening. Infection by flood spores doesn't usually result in a conventional combat form. The body will continue to be infected and mutated until there is not a single normal healthy cell of the host left. Boil-like structures will have formed across the body with tentacle-like sensing appendages protruding from their centers. The body would remain largely the same overall shape. Unlike conventional combat forms that experience varying levels of decay, the heavy mutation, including whip-like tentacles and the protrusion of the infection form from the chest cavity, the spore infected remain largely intact, but will be driven to consume and gather biomass by attacking and infecting other life forms nearby. Mutations of a lesser degree take place during this time to facilitate the continued infection, and eventually, when the host's body becomes damaged or simply deteriorates over time, mutation will change the body into varying types of carrier forms, some being the bulbous infection form filled carrier form we are familiar with, others maintaining a humanoid form, with infection forms being incubated within the abdominal cavity. In both cases, the mutation is to facilitate the creation of the infection form the Flood's desired means of infection. Infection forms are the primary method that the Flood infects hosts. While small, roughly the size of a human torso, and weak, they travel together in massive swarms and overwhelm foes using sheer numbers. Infection forms develop from a form vaguely resembling a larva or tadpole, but bearing the basic superficial characteristics of a pod infector. A number of these flood forms in this stage of their life cycle were kept in stasis by foreigners in flood research facilities such as the one in the Threshold gas mine. These generally grow from flood biomass blisters within carrier forms or within the body cavity of latter stage spore infected hosts. Once within range of a potential host, they perform impressively large leaps for their comparative size, aiming for the victim's chest area. The subsequent events take place extremely rapidly over the course of the following few seconds. The infection form uses these appendages to penetrate deep into the body and tap into the victim's spinal cord, then performing an aggressive attack on the host's nervous system via direct contact with the spine, which enabled the flood form direct access to the host's brain. Once this is accomplished, the form rewrites the neural pathways of the victim's brain with its tendrils, forcing a resonant frequency match between its neural signals and the host's. At this point, the infection form has complete control over the motor functions of the host, and the victim undergoes a death-like experience, in that consciousness ceases completely a form of brain death. But while the individual experiences this death, the infection form in fact keeps the brain and body alive, and continues to mutate and manipulate the body. As the infection form hacks into the host's nervous system, it releases encapsulated flood supercells into the body. These cells interface with the host cells and digest them and convert their components into new flood cells. This process has two functions, one, to begin the process of systemic mutation, and two, to deflate the body of the infection form, allowing the next stage of infection. At this point, the infection form burrows into the host's body moving aside the internal organs and taking up residence within the chest cavity. Having achieved total control over the host, the infection form reshapes the body into a form more suitable for attacking enemies, a combat form. Where the entire body is converted to flood biomass, an additional growth of tentacles from the wrists are facilitated as a form of melee combat, as well as serving several other functions currently unknown to any but the flood themselves. Even if the infection form is quickly removed from the host's body, the injection of flood cells into the host system is enough to cause rapid transformation into spore-packed blisters, thus ensuring a form of infection of proximate creatures continues to take place. In exceedingly rare cases, such as if the infection form has been damaged or is incredibly old, it will go through this process without killing the host, leaving them at least partially aware of what is going on but unable to move or act. This was the fate of UNSC Private Wallace A. Jenkins during the raid on the Covenant Weapons Cache on Installation 04. 
This aged form of the infection form must have been kept in captivity for far too long, thereby reducing its potential of complete transformation of its host into a flood combat form. Jenkins survived infection and even remained conscious with short periods of time where he could exert control over his now mutated body, which is arguably the cruelest and most horrific way for this to happen. An infection form may abandon its host if the corpse has been heavily damaged and look for a new one. If the infection form inside the combat form has been destroyed but the combat form itself is still intact enough to continue serving its purpose, another infection form may burrow inside the body and take place of the one that mutated it, effectively reanimating the combat form. Once infected, the infection form is able to absorb all of the host's knowledge and memories. As a result, combat forms are capable of operating firearms, driving vehicles, operating tools, and even starships. In the case of the Infinite Succors infection, infected warriors were able to set up patrols of the ship's corridors to guard the proto-gravemind growing in the ship. The Flood's possession of an individual's body allows it to speak with the host's tongue. This memory absorption extends to critical knowledge such as command codes or colony locations. As such, when critical personnel are infected, they are contributed to the construction of a grave mind. In combat, combat forms use their whip or scythe-like growths to attack their opponents in melee combat, and are capable of performing superhuman feats such as leaping large distances to cover ground. Even if a melee strike is not fatal, the imparted flood supercell is enough to ensure the target's infection and eventual death. As the infection forms do not feel pain, combat forms are not affected by enemy attacks and will not stop until they are destroyed, or the enemy is killed. Ballistic weapons are notably less effective against combat forms because of this, with the SRS 99C S2 AM sniper rifle rounds passing straight through combat forms with virtually no effect. Targeted shots against the limbs and embedded infection form are effective ways of dispatching combat forms. Combat forms form the majority of the Flood's combatant forces, particularly in the feral stage of the parasite's development in which it has yet to acquire enough raw biomass for the creation of a grave mind or pure forms. During this stage, combat forms are not centrally controlled and will begin to gather bodies for conversion into more Flood forms. If a location cannot be immediately secured, multiple combat forms may merge to create the Juggernaut and Abomination key mind forms, able to direct local forces in the area until a permanent presence can be established. While any life form with some level of awareness and or sentience can be infected, not all of them are suitable to serve the function as combat forms. The Flood's signature and preferred mobile form utilized during the feral stage. While these hosts are transformed in a similar fashion to the traditional combat forms, these forms are not often employed in frontline combat for several reasons. The first of these would be the fact that such life forms, despite their sophisticated nervous systems and adequate levels of sentience, simply lack the necessary biomass, calcium reserves, and physical strength to make first choice combat units. More specifically, when a host life form is transformed, the activities of the infection form require not only the aforementioned levels of biomass, calcium content, and strength, but that the host has the physical endurance and stamina to withstand the process. Species such as humans, Forerunner, Sanghili, and Jilhane are almost always turned into combat forms because their biology and physical properties enable them to withstand the infection form's abilities, which are violent and resource intensive. The next vital use for lesser hosts is to serve as the second signature form of the feral stage, the mobile pod infector incubator, known as a carrier form. When a local biosphere has been completely assimilated into the Flood, typically once the Flood has entered the coordinated stage, combat forms cannot be created anymore due to the lack of viable hosts. Due to this, the Flood moves on to breaking down raw biomass into Flood supercells, thereby creating pure forms of Holy Flood biomass. Once the number of pure forms reaches a sufficient equilibrium, combat forms are relegated to defensive roles or added to the hive's raw biomass or calcium reserves, 
Otherwise, aging combat forms eventually begin to spontaneously grow infection forms within a large, bulbous mass on their back. Eventually, this turns the combat form into a carrier form. Combat forms that have outlived their usefulness or become too damaged to fight will begin to spontaneously generate pod infectors within their host's bodies. As the upper body swells to grotesque proportions, the limbs of the combat form wither away into stumpy legs and flailing tentacle-like appendages. The flood form is now unable to defend itself but still retains enough mobility to move towards potential hosts. Carrier forms perpetuate the flood species by acting as mobile incubators for newly created infection forms. If potential hosts are detected, the flood form will simply waddle within range of them, throw itself on the ground and expand its incubation sac with gases until it explodes. The detonation scatters the infection forms and can injure or kill potential hosts, with the explosion being comparable to that of a fragmentation grenade. While these are usually formed from weakened, damaged, or aged combat forms, weaker host forms are just as frequently employed for this purpose. The first step in the creation of a carrier form by this method involves a single appropriate host to function as a nucleus, which is then followed by one or more other weaker forms attaching themselves to the leading unit. The congregated hosts then fuse, with the external host forms being rapidly digested by the central form, with the result being that the other hosts have been reduced to extra generic biomass, contributing to the structure of the now significantly distorted, bloated incubator. Onwards from this, the path of the individual becomes so blurred that it is reasonable to say, after the next stage of mutation, the individual's journey comes to an end. And that is when the body no longer serves any purpose other than biomass that feeds into the formation of a grave mind. But there is one method of infection we have yet to cover, and that is the creation of a proto grave mind. Proto grave minds are created when the flood has amassed sufficient bodies and minds to become sentient. In order to create a viable mind, large numbers of flood forms and corpses are merged into a globular mass which uses this combined knowledge derived from each host. They are usually formed in order to handle advanced tasks such as piloting a starship, in which case flood forms will merge as many hosts as possible with that knowledge, such as former pilots and officers. The proto-grave mind is stationary and likely directs nearby combat forms to pilot the ships, similar to the way a fully formed grave mind will direct flood forms to execute battle strategies and other complex tasks. Rather than completely destroying a victim's consciousness, as a normal flood form generally does, it interrogates its victims. Slowly. Intimately. Even speaking telepathically to them, and allowing their nervous systems to feed it information. The form tortures the host's mind with a loud buzzing sound, thus erasing all thought. Only after the host is stripped of all knowledge is the host killed by the proto-grave mind. This is a process, depending on the strength of the mind of the individual, can take minutes, hours, or even days. Although it is sometimes possible for a host to die before the flood form has a chance to assimilate all of its memories. Unlike all other known flood forms, Proto-grave minds are immobile and passive in combat. They have never been observed to move on their own, even when combat forms are fighting nearby. In fact, even when John 117 punched through the side of a proto-grave mind present aboard the Truth and Reconciliation during the Battle of Installation 04, the flood form did not react at all. It is likely that until the transformation into a true grave mind is complete, proto-grave minds are nothing more than an amalgamation of inactive bodies. In most instances, they use some of their host's legs as a means to support themselves, and one can see some of the bodies of the most recent assimilated embedded in the proto-grave mind's mass, albeit deformed. As the corpses become more deformed, a proto-grave mind's appearance take on a large body of flood tissue and biomass. This is usually the absolute limit of discernible and identifiable physical involvement possible in the process of infection. Anything after this 
is really the physical form of the host being broken down into biomass to feed into the grave mind and support the flood hive as a whole, while the mental faculties are simply merged with the flood's superintelligence. No identity is maintained, no ego of the individual survives this process. At this point, there is literally nothing left of the original host. At this point, your struggle, your pain, your horrors come to an end. After this stage, grave minds and key minds can be formed, pure forms can be created and the flood can continue to spread, infect and dominate until there is no biodiversity left in the galaxy. Until there is literally nothing but the flood. And then, peace. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below. I look forward to what you have to say. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons, Neek the Silent Cartographer, Brian, Sebastian, Red Sea and Darian, Stork of the Realms, Falcon X003, Alvin, Mr. Fell, Flaming Halo, The Revanche, Starlight, Viking, Legions Lost, The TG7, Catheter Cam, TJ Jazz, The Holds of the Mantle, my glorious reclaimers, my loyal metarchs, and all the other patrons that have jumped aboard to support the channel. You guys are awesome and all this wouldn't be possible without you. If you like Halo Lord Disgust to insane levels of detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels, including Discord, and if you really love the channel, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there. It would mean the world to me and would free up more of my time for me to point to this content and other Halo-related goodness. Take it easy, everyone, and... Find peace in the domain.